Well, we're ready to begin again this evening, and we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we will be looking at verses 22 through 25, and uh, I will read that. I listened to a sermon today. I'm going to listen to a series of sermons this is on uh, one of the sites I listen on, and it's a preacher who preaches through the book of First Peter. And so his introduction was today. And he said, I'll have the congregation stand as we read our text. He said, we will begin with verse 1 and continue through the end of verse (laughs) 1. And you could hear the the congregation laugh. (laughs) That's what I thought. I thought, I like this sermon. (laughs) He's gonna, off with he's gonna milk it for all it's worth. I already knew he was gonna do it, and then I got tickled as he was going on through. Of course, First Peter's not that large of a uh, epistle, what five chapters? He said, "Now, several years when we finally get through this, I think he was joking because there wasn't quite that many sermons." He said, "You, we'll we'll remember some of the things I said here today." Anyway, beginning in verse twenty-two, Paul asks the question: Are the Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten, times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, and three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I'm going to go ahead and read a few more. We might not get into all of them. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers in, on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Let's ask God to bless our study. Father, thank you again this evening for allowing us to be here. We love you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit. We come so thankful and joyful over the fact that we are saved by his precious blood. We are thankful that he sought and saved us. The Bible teaches his purpose is to seek and save the lost. We would have never found him on our own. We thank you, Father, for this word that is before us. And as we come now to this portion of scripture, we ask that you might grant unto us understanding that you might uh, apply this word to our hearts, that we might be more glorious, glorifying to you by the way that we live in this world and being good witnesses of you to those who are lost. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, this section might well be called Humble boasting. I think that that's probably the best way to put it. In fact, I used this twice yesterday in two different sermons at Summit and at Litchfield because somehow I was able to work this passage in. (laughs) Not that it was a hard fit, but whatever I was talking on, can't remember right now, this just seemed like a very good thing to add there. Now, when you think about that, being humble and bragging, you automatically reach the point to where you say to yourself, I don't see how that can possibly uh, occur because these are mutually exclusive. They are at far ends of the spectrum. If a person is a braggart, then we don't consider them to be very humble. And a humble person is marked by their lack of bragging. But here, we find an example of how you can actually maintain humility and at the same time boast. 
and it's pulled off by the Apostle Paul. If there was ever anybody who could do it, it would, of course, be him. And if you remember, he is in a position where he is defending his superiority of the false teachers. So he has to somehow elevate himself up above those who have caused the dissension and the division at the church of Corinth. Because this, this church has gone into full-scale mutiny. Now, by the time we get where we are here, and again, let me emphasize, particularly, you all hear me all the time, but those who are listening, when you study the Bible, you have to look at these verses in context with the epistle. Can you imagine if we just come in here and did not go through the first uh, 11 chapters down to this point and pull these verses out and try to talk about what they meant? How shallow that would be. I mean, all I would see would be, well, is Paul crying in his milk here? You know, I mean, is, this, <laughs> is, is, he, is, is he having a pity party about all the things of which he has gone through? Is he telling us that what we need to do is suffer like he did, and if we don't, we're not really worthy of going to heaven? What, what's his meaning? And we would be left just to my opinion, which I am not comfortable giving. You know, that's, that's not the way you study the Bible. I've seen a little uh, film on some site I was watching. I watch so much I can't keep up with it. But anyway, it was showing how most people do contemporary Bible studies. And, you know, it's really a shame, and I've held many of them. Uh, but now that we know what we're doing, we don't see that too much anymore. But basically what happens is, is the leader gets up and he'll say, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Well, now, Ryan, what do you think that means? And then Ryan may say, Well, that means this to me. And I'm supposed to say, That's really good, Ryan. Sarge, what do you think it means? Now, Sarge might say something totally different, the far opposite end of the spectrum from what Ryan said. And, and I'm supposed to say to Sarge, That's really interesting. That's a great comment there. Now, what about you, Ann? What do you think it means? And by the time you get all the way around the table, you've got 15 different views. And then we'll say, Well, let's move now to verse 23. That is not Bible study because it doesn't matter what you think it means. That's not what we're after. That's a man-centered approach to the study of Scripture. What does God mean? <laughs> you know, what did the Holy Spirit mean when he inspired Paul to write these words? That's what we're trying to uncover. And during the Bible study, the leader should field questions since he's done the background of what's taken place. And, and then if, if others have, they can contribute then to that. But it's not for us to sit here and tell one another what this means to me personally. Uh, because there is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so I can only imagine... Uh, 20 years ago, somebody asking me to address these verses. I would have had no clue. I would have probably said, Paul was just talking about being an apostle is a hard thing. And that would have been the lesson. And most people would have said, well, we're not apostles, so I can dismiss that as anything cru crucial to me. But actually, since we have taken the time and exercised our reasoning and skills at study, to, to figure out what's going on and why Paul would write such a statement. And when you do, we are reminded of what happens at Corinth. And we know the story of he's been there 18 months when he established the church. He, uh, you can go back into the book of Acts, I think it's around the 18th chapter and read of that. Uh, and how he started the church, got fed up with the Jews in the synagogue who he was trying to teach. They just reacted horribly. So Paul runs next door. He said, henceforth I go to the Gentiles and abutting the synagogue. I love that. That means they shared the same wall. It was the house of a Roman. And Paul goes in and converts him. And then he's dragged into court by the Jews. And... Uh, if you remember, 
the, the new leader, the, before that happened, the leader of the synagogue was converted. And so it was, he was replaced by a man by the name of Sothenes. And Sothenes tries the case before Gallio. Remember, we studied this in Acts. And Gallio said, listen, I ain't here to quibble or to get involved in your all's religious quarrels. If this was a matter of Roman law, I would gladly hear you. But you're talking about who does what and saves who. And he said, get out of my courtroom. And he had his soldiers drive them from the place. This is interesting because this, the, 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 they drive them out. And the Jews of the synagogue turn on their new leader, Sothenes. And they beat him in the street. Apparently they felt like he wasn't doing very well as a prosecutor of Paul. And next thing we know, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul's greeting the Corinthians and he mentions Sothenes, our brother. <laughs> so, so after the beating, it appears that Sothenes ends up becoming a Christian. So I love to run across things such as that. But anyway, uh, the church at Corinth continued with Paul for 18 months. He leaves. The Judaizers come in. These are not necessarily Jews who don't believe in Jesus. They believe in Jesus, but Jesus isn't enough. Uh, the real crux of salvation is found in circumcision and in law keeping and add Jesus in for good measure. And they did that. Paul had no small dissension with them and they hound him now for the rest of his life. But never much to his face. They wait till he leaves a congregation. They come in, try to tear down his reputation, discredit him, question his integrity. Uh, can't really do much with his doctrine. So if you can't ever answer the arguments, then just attack the man. And uh, that's what they do. do the, they do that in politics all the time. You know, that's why everybody was so upset after that first debate. I, I've still not yet understood with all the mass communication systems we have why we have the debates at all. I already knew the positions of both men before they ever got up there, you know. Right, you know, I mean, that, yeah, I don't even know why they do that. They, I, I just can't believe that there's that many undecided people as to which side of these issues am I on. And if you don't know the issues, and what's at stake, then you ought not to vote, you know, that's, uh, uh, so I, I've just never understood why we do that. Now, there was probably a time when you needed to, when there wasn't a 24-hour news station that was putting them up there, and back when you moved from, when like Lincoln and Douglas, when they had their debates, I can understand why they had that. They went into small towns that didn't know Lincoln and Douglas, and they had to both get up there and tell the towns what they believed so the people would know which side of the river they were on. But when it comes to this day and age, I don't see that as a great factor, just something that we do probably out of tradition. But if you'll notice, that first debate was basically an attack on each other, and we as Americans are like the Romans sitting in an amphitheater. We like it when the gladiators go at one another. <laughs> and and, and are, are somewhat entertained, even though we try to say, Oh, that's horrible, but we yet sit there hypnotically looking at <laughs> our TV, uh, watching it and kind of yaying when our guy says something that hurts the other guy, and then yay, and the other guy says something that hurts our guy, we go boo, <laughs> you know, it it becomes a spectator sport, and that, that's dangerous because there's really high principle uh, high principles at stake here, you know, it's more than just something to be entertained by. But nonetheless, they're in there, and they attack Paul, and the Corinthians fall for it. Now, by the time Paul writes 2 Corinthians, they have repented. So this is written against a, a, written against a backdrop of, of praise for the fact that they've come to their senses. You may say, well, then why is Paul kind of poking the dog in the cage? You know, because that seems like what he's doing. Everybody's all right, so why bring that up again? It reminds me of 
Marlan and I over the years when we've had fights and made up and then one of us will say, but you know, talking about what we got into it about. Now, why do that if you've got it all fixed out? But I think that we're probably not the only couple that does that. <laughs> and sometimes we can go, yeah, I know it, three days later and you bring it all back up and here you go. <laughs> it starts all over again. Uh, but nonetheless, you might get that idea. Paul's poking around, trying to get him. No, he's not. The, the problem is the cage ain't empty. The dog's still in it, okay? The, the, the dogs are still there. And Paul knows it. And the Corinthians know it. And the Corinthians have already proved to Paul they're not all that steadfast in their standing. So if he just lets this go without showing them where they made their error in discerning who is true and who is false, it won't be long till guess what? Those guys will get a upper hand again. So this is insurance. He's saying now, apparently I didn't do a good job the first time around, didn't feel like I had to talk on that, about how to be discerning between true and false teachers, and here's the end result. I figured you knowing the truth would be good enough to keep you from falling for error. And there's a lesson for us in that. Just because you know the truth doesn't mean that you won't fall for error. <clears throat> you have <coughs> got to be able to use the truth you know. That's the skill of discernment. You've got to be able to discern. Right. You've got to be able to discern and distinguish and discriminate between truth and error. Uh, it's, a, it, it's amazing to me how that people I know who are good Bible students can get carried away by something horribly erroneous. Uh, I can't remember who it was who was telling me uh, about a book I really needed to read in which God was a woman. And I thought, you have lost me there. Uh, and they kept saying, oh, but the principles are in there. And I thought, well, if the principles are in this book with God portrayed as a woman, first of all, why portray God as a woman when the scriptures doesn't? And if the principles are in that book, why can't we just pull the principles out of the scriptures? But anyway, and this was not from a novice, and this wasn't from a person who wasn't a faithful, studious person of, uh, of, of the gospel. And, and, you know, one of the things I hope that I have trained you, and you need to use those skills when you listen to preachers and preaching, to try to figure out where they're coming from on the issue of salvation. Now, there's a lot of secondary issues you'll hear different things on, and, and, and that's okay. But what I'm talking about is how that many will add in to the cross of Christ under legitimate things of a secondary nature but promote them to primary importance and make them part of your salvation uh, you know if you and it sounds good when they're in the pulpit talking to you do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. A really good text for this day and age. We need to be reminded of that so that we will exhort one another so much the more as we see that day approaching. And true, true, true. Church attendance is of utmost importance for many, but many reasons. But then when they say, and if you don't, you need to, 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 to realize you're not going to heaven. God's going to judge you based on that. And, you know, I hear, again, my brothers who know better say, that's, that's so good. He really got that point across. No, he just taught you a false doctrine. Nowhere did Jesus say, he that believeth and goes to church, I will say. For by church attendance are you saved, and that not of yourselves. That's not what Ephesians 2 says. Are, are you following my argument? Um, so they take something which is true, but they elevate it. And they put it on equal importance. And you know, once you start doing that, 
Before long, you've got everything on the same equal plane of Christ, and then guess who's going to be saved? Nobody. Why? Because there ain't nobody who is able to do all of that. That's the whole purpose of not being under law. That's what we've been freed from. And Paul said in Romans, beware that you do not exchange the grace of Christ for law. Don't make the, the New Testament, the New Covenant, a covenant of law. Because it isn't. And it would be just change the commandments, I guess we could say. We ain't no more better equipped to keep those either than we were the, the first ones. But anyway, that's what's going on here. But to get that message in, they got to get rid of the one who started the church. So they attack Paul. They fall for it. Paul knows that these guys aren't really solid. They fail once. They may fall again. So let me tell you then, he says, here's some tests. I want you to be able to discern who's telling you the truth so that the next group of guys running in here won't get a toehold and uh, one of the ways that he does that and we followed his argument is that true teachers of God are people who are humble humility is one of the main marks well how do you tell somebody that without sounding proud I'm a true apostle because I'm more humble than them guys <laughs> You know, so in the very thing that he is having to do could be taken, right, in the wrong way. Because how many times in the last couple of chapters has he talked about the foolishness of boasting, the foolishness of boasting, the foolishness of boasting? I speak as of insane. We'll look at that statement here to, tonight. And I have to really feel his pain at this point. He is feeling the tension between this humility and his need to talk about his work. I mean, he, 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 he's being pulled. He doesn't, as you know, like to talk about himself at all. Sarge. You can, you can also see the frustration in, in a little bit out of this, too, because it seems like he's talking to them and they're just... Yeah. just overlooking it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. He's, got to, he's got to drive it home. He's, it's time to be plain. So he doesn't like talking about himself. He'd rather, as he has said himself on numerous occasions, boast in his weakness. So really, he's in a balancing act. He is trying to remain humble, but at the same time defend himself and talk about his work and how his work is different than what the false teachers has done. But he is forced into it. Now, when approached from that way, this then becomes a wonderful and insightful portion of Scripture. It turns out to be one of the richest expressions of humility in the Scripture. Uh, because he is able, as we're going to see, to pull that off. So Paul is writing to affirm himself. Uh, he spent a lot of time with these guys, you know with the Corinthians. Uh, Paul has confronted them with their error. He's mad because they've given them the pulpit. Paul loves them with a godly jealousy, he says. And he now needs to make sure that he gets himself ingrained permanently in their heart so they won't be led astray so easily. And they, they, they've pulled a number on him, these false teachers have. They have tried to destroy his integrity. They've discredited him. They've, they've done everything that can possibly be done to make Paul look bad and uh, to assassinate his character. And all of it is because they want to teach a false doctrine. And you may wonder, why, why would somebody want to teach a false doctrine? Now that sounds unfamiliar to us. But now remember, these guys aren't saved. So what's, what, what's the driving force in the life of an unsaved person? There's only two driving forces. There's only two things motivate you and I and the world. You're either being led by the flesh, which is your fallen humanness, the unredeemed impulses of your old man, or you are led by the Spirit. 
Well, what is the flesh like? Likes itself, right? I mean, you just look at sins, uh, like adultery. Why, why, why do people commit adultery? Because I want that woman. You know, in a sexual way. You know, it's interesting when we were looking over in, uh, I was teaching yesterday at Summit in Litchfield, and we got to the point of where Samson has, uh, begins his work. And you know, there's so many shadows of Christ in these stories in the Judges, because chapter 13 talks about Samson's, uh, the announcement of Samson's birth and nothing about Samson's childhood. You start with verse 1, chapter 14, he's a grown man, headed to Timnah. Who's that sound like? You read all that about Jesus, the only childhood event we got is when he's 12, but that was actually when he was becoming a man, and then it was silent up until he was 30 years of age. Yeah, you know, so, 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 so most of his life, nothing is spoken of. We've just got everything he did in three years. And uh, anyway, but Samson goes to Timnah, and God has not quite used him yet, <clears throat> chosen him, sent him into the world, created him, created him like he is, which you may think to yourself, wow. <laughs> you know, because listen, Samson is far from what anybody would think when you read his story of being a hero of faith. Yet he makes the hall of fame of the faithful. But God had to have a man that was this way to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish the way he wanted to accomplish it. So nonetheless, the story begins with Samson going down to Timnah, which is a Philistine city. And when he gets there, <clears throat> the Bible says he sees a woman. This is not Delilah. Samson had an eye for the wit ladies. And, and he sees a woman. And the Bible in the King James Version, the authorized version, says she is pleasing to me. I love the New American Standards brutality. She looks good to me. Okay? And he, when his daddy and mommy ask him about it, why he couldn't get a woman from there in their town, guess what he says again? I want her. She looks good to me. And so you can see what was driving him. And uh, so you can see those kinds of, uh, of, of similarities uh, as you look at that. So everything is not as it appears to be. You've got to you either live by the flesh. Samson was living by the flesh. That's what the false teachers were doing. They're living by the flesh. But, you know, it, it doesn't have to be an immoral act. There's pride. There's the desire to control others. Uh, you know, it's interesting and, and you know, even among Christians, we have this, this. This, I mean, you know, we still have manifestations of our flesh, and it's always right. I, I like to think of my humanness, the, that the, those propensities of the old man, those impulses. They're, you know, like I'm fortified now by the Holy Spirit. You know, he he has walled me in. But my flesh is always putting the ladder against the wall and scaling the top, trying to get back in control. That's the warfare that Paul speaks of, shooting the arrows over at me through the form of temptation, being led by Satan. My flesh knows what it likes. Mm -hmm. Satan knows what I like and what I did before I was redeemed. And so constantly baiting the hook and throwing the hook in front of us. And so there's where the, the, the struggle comes. But I was watching the other day uh, three different preachers uh, whom I enjoy their scholarship, but all three had a different take on whether you should vote this time around. One just said it's always the Christian's obligation to vote regardless of what's going on because you can vote against any party that might be promoting immorality. There was a second guy who took a middle ground. He has voted and not voted over the years, and he was talking about why he was going to vote this time. Then there was another guy who got on and said he was not going to vote because it, basically evil in both camps, and he said a vote for evil either way in his heart and conscience 
is something he should not do. And I kept thinking, thank you guys for muddying the water for me. <laughs> you know, but anyway, that's what they're doing. Well, you know, that was good, and I liked it, and I appreciate all three of them doing it. You wouldn't believe the hateful comments that people were making uh, under their their speeches. It just erupted uh, because how dare they disagree with me? And it wasn't people in the world. It was people that were also Christians. One of them said, they called, the one guy's comment said, so-and-so's lost his mind. Another one said, I can't believe he did that. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, guys, because you know what the Bible really says about this when it comes to matters of conscience? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Voting is not something you have to do. That's like the eating of meats or the eating of vegetables. Right? Paul had to deal with that. And in that chapter, he got down to the very end and he said, let every man be persuaded in his own heart. For whatsoever is not his faith is sin. Now, he's not saying that, you know, uh, I can make drinking a glass of water a, a, a sin, but there, it, that it is a sin, but I can make it a sin. If I, for example, have conscience problems with drinking water, right? And I violate my conscience, then I have sinned against my own heart. And see, Christians are supposed to respect liberty, Right? But see what caused these guys to respond that way in such hatred and with such animosity to these men's positions. Right. Their flesh, the pride. So see, it's if it's that evident in those of us who are born again, what do you think the world is like? You, you, you see what I'm saying? They're completely controlled and they don't even give a thought about it. So these false teachers are teaching falsely because they're all about themselves. They want a name. They like recognition. They want to live in the limelight. They like control. They like power. And, 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 and you know, Paul's done been in there, so how can I be? And money. Money's come up several times in this. And Paul's done been in there, and, and they, they can't really outshine him unless they first put him under a basket. Then we can outshine him. See, so it's all about com competition, competing with Paul. That's what they're doing. So that's their motive. It's not that they're really sitting there saying, let's take somebody to hell. I, you know, I don't think they were doing that. And they probably were convinced that what they were teaching was the truth. But that was not the motive. Because if it was the motive, they wouldn't have done it the way they did it. They would have just went in and said, like Paul's doing. Paul's wrong, here's why. But they ain't done that. See, they just went in and said, well, I know that's what you say, but you're misusing, Paul, the Scripture. You know, and then, then proved where he was. That's the way you handle that. You don't kill the guy who is teaching it, you know. But that's, that, that's, that's why they, they want to get in there and, and do this. So Paul now has to force himself to deal with that. And as he does this, he says a lot about his ministry and the character of his life. And that starts here in verse 22. He starts making a comparison between himself and them. And he does so very plainly. As you know, don't confuse humility with timidity, with being timid. You know, some people don't think you can tell people the truth and still remain humble. No, telling people who you know are going to get mad at you for telling them the truth is probably one of the greatest acts of humility that I can think of. Because yourself is completely out of that picture. And, you know, as a preacher, uh, that is a very serious temptation for me to get in the pulpit and challenge the norm and to tell people that the norm that they have held to for all these years is wrong you know I, I don't like doing that and you know there's times when I can feel the the demonic pressure of soften that a bit 
maybe don't even do it at all. One of the reasons I like expositional preaching is I can't do that. It's there. So even though I might be reluctant, you all would notice if I jumped 15 verses. And then when you go back and look, I'm saying, well, I know why he did that. <laughs> you know, so, so it, it, you know, and if I feel that force, you know, and I'm, I, and I'm aware of its presence, uh, I can imagine somebody who's not looking for that. Anyway, so Paul has to do this, and he does it plainly, and he does it because he loves the Corinthians, and there's even a higher motive than that. He's all about the glory of who? God. And so the larger context here starts in verse 22 and goes through verse 13. Uh, it's it, it's or verse 13 of chapter 12. He hates doing this. And if you remember, he has said, he's. it's interesting, he's just now getting to the argument. You know where he started this argument at? Look over in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. But we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. He starts apologizing. And what I mean by apology, I'm not saying he's begging them to forgive him for something wrong. The word apologize simply means giving a defense. He starts giving a defense of what he's getting ready to do in verse 13 and continues that defense all the way down to verse 22. That's how reluctant he is to do it. It's like if you were sitting there and he was talking, you said, well, come on, hurry up and get to it. Tell me what you're getting to. You know, you, you, you might think he's beating around the bush, but he's not. He's just reluctant to do what he knows he's got to do. And he wants to make sure that these guys know he's not bragging on himself. He wants to make sure they know that. And so he does kind of beat this to death. Just over and over and over again. He uses a chapter and a, uh, a half to get that point across to them. He says, I'm only going to tell you the truth. And as I said, he has a real hard time here getting started. Um, verse 12 of chapter 10, look what he said before he even began. We're not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. I don't want to do this. You know. He says, but when they measure themselves by themselves, compare themselves with, with themselves there without understanding. You see what he just said? He said, I'm not doing this to brag. I'm not so bold as to come in and compare myself with those birds. That's not what this is about. But have you seen what they've done? He says that they are comparing themselves by themselves and, and, and seeing themselves as something great. He said, so they're without without understanding. I've got to correct this. That's when he went into verse 13. He says, but I'll not boast beyond my measure. See how all this starts just exploding as far as you understanding what it is that he's saying and why it is that he does this? So he's been given disclaimers all the way down through chapter 11 and verse 21. He, some of the words I love, he calls it foolish. He calls it folly. He calls it fleshly. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's just, uh, he's really feeling this, this tension. This is distasteful to him. And, and he's being forced to do it. because. And, and remember last time where he says, I can't find where Christ ever did this. Remember when we pointed that out uh, on Friday night? He, he said, you know, that Jesus, Jesus, you know, there, there's, there's nothing I can find where Jesus did this kind of thing. So I don't have a model here. But he does have something, and that's the Holy Spirit or someone who helps him and helps him well as we're going to see. But I've got to do it. So finally he comes to verse 22. Now here he starts his apostolic credentials. Okay? Here's where the comparison really begins. And it's a powerful display of his humility in the midst of his boasting. And so you will find in verse 22 
there is a phrase repeated three times. So am I. In verse 23, there's a phrase repeated three times. I'm more so. So now he's comparing and contrasting himself to the false teachers. He shows where they are equal and he shows where they are not. And he shows his superiority. So in verse 22, he puts himself equal to them and they to him on the basis of his heritage. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Now, do you think he just said the same thing three ways, or do you think there's a difference in meaning in those three expressions? That might give us a little bit of insight. We know they're rhetorical questions. He's not really wanting, you know, the answer's obvious. The answer's in the question. Am I a Hebrew? Yes. Are you an Israelite? Yes. Are you a descendant of Abraham? Well, if I'm the first two, I have to be a descendant of Abraham, according to the flesh. And... Uh, I think it's probably because they were questioning some of this with him. And you may wonder how could they question it because we know definitely he was Jewish. Well, here's some possibilities. You remember where he was born? He was born in Tarsus. Okay, Tarsus is in... Uh, modern day Turkey. So he wasn't born in the nation of Israel. Even though he's a Jew, they would have been considered Jews who had dispersed. You, you, you see what I'm saying? That had left the homeland. Now, let me tell you something. In Israel, the Jews in the southern part near the capital, thought themselves superior to others. All of Jesus' apostles were Galileans, save Judas. Do you remember that? Do you, do you remember reading through the Gospels how they spoke with contempt of the Galileans? They always thought them inferior, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and all of them thought they were inferior because they're far north. They're on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They're up there. They're not down here in the center of conservatism. Which is good because Jesus couldn't have challenged all the things he challenged if he'd had a group of Pharisees with him. His own disciples would have killed him before he ever got started. But he took the, he took the Galileans who were because they were further away from the center, weren't so entrenched, you know, in, in, in the dogma of the Pharisees. Um, all of the uh, all the twelve apostles were Jews, though they were Palestinian. They all were born and died in in uh, Israel. Paul was a Greek Jew, so maybe this question is asked because they were saying uh, he's not really a, a Hebrew. Not not a not a Hebrew Hebrew, <laughs> you know you know what I'm saying. He's, he's oh yeah he's Hebrew technically if that's what you mean, uh, but he he's not not you know he's not like the other twelve. He 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 was raised somewhere else. It's kind of like a you know a lot of times you go down in the south and they'll talk about somebody yeah that's my neighbor he's been there 25 years but you know he's a Yankee. And, and he's still a Yankee, even though he's been there 25 years. You know, he's <laughs> even though even though he's he, he just what what they mean by that? He wasn't born here. <laughs> you know, and the same thing happens up there. You know, they. Uh, uh, I was listening to something somebody said, and they were talking about. They said that when he said when my mother died, he said I went back to New England 
for the funeral. And he said uh, she had been there, she was like 80, and he said she'd been there since she was 10. Her family moved up there, so you're looking like at 70 years. And he, she, he said the obituary said she was not a native of New England. <laughs> You know, she was she was from somewhere else. She, she seventy years versus She's ten. An alien. Yeah, and we still do the same kinds of things, though, even from the other side. I know when I talk about going to see mom, I say I'm going where home. Now I've been here longer than I was there. You you, you see what I'm saying? But we, me and Marlena both would say, Are "You going home this weekend?" I think we'll go home. And, you know, like I say, I'm 60. I left home when I was 22, so do the math. So I've been here longer than I was, uh, you know, almost 40 years here versus 22 years there. And uh, I know it's hard to believe that I'm 60. <laughs> For those of you watching by, fa uh, by YouTube, they didn't fall for that. They didn't act surprised when I said I was 60. I was just pretending. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so Paul wants to make sure they understand he's not one whip behind any of them. Uh, when, when they call them Hebrew, that has to do with their basically their language. Okay? It's associated mostly with their dialect. Interesting. In Belize, Whenever, you know, they're all Mayan natives, but they'll say, oh, he's catchy. You know what they're talking about? Language. Speaks a language different than what we speak. We speak Mayan. He speaks catchy. But they're all the same lineage. But it's just interesting how those cultural norms get built into uh, society. Uh, foreigners used the word Hebrew of the Jews. It means a descendant of Eber, and the Jews even referred to themselves as Hebrew, so it's not a bad term. And even though Paul was born in Tarsus, he was still a Hebrew. Look at what he says over in Philippians. Do what? Well, everything was Rome at this point. Tarsus was in Turkey. Yeah, it's in Turkey, as far as geographically. But it was still under Rome. Yeah. In fact, it was considered Grecian, a Greek. Greek was the first kingdom before Rome. But in Philippians 3 and verse Paul, or verse 5, verse Paul, Paul yeah. verse Paul, verse 5, Paul says of himself, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So, you know, he might have had to defend himself more than once on that particular issue. But he knew the language, he had lived in Palestine, he followed the Hebrew tradition. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was educated under Gamaliel, who was one of the most renowned Jewish rabbis at that time. Um, and uh, he, every time he gave his defense of being a Christian, he started with his Hebrewness and shown how that Christ was the fulfillment of what his Hebrewness was, was, a, was about. Next, he uses the term Israelite. And an Israelite means a descendant of Jacob. Okay, which of course all Hebrews would be. And then he traces it on back to Abraham. And what he means by that is, I'm of that same covenant, that old covenant that these guys are trying to bind on you all. The Abrahamic, uh, uh, the law came from Moses, but through the line of Abraham. So he was saying socially, religiously, covenantly, linguistically, nationally, any way you want to slice this pie, okay, I'm in the nation of Israel. They can't come in and make me sound inferior. You see what he's saying? They can't come in here and, and say, you can't listen to Paul because, you know, he was born over in, in Turkey. You can't come in here and he says, no, I was born in Turkey, but I'm still a Hebrew. I'm still an Israelite. I am still uh, a descendant of Abraham. So if they are those things, then so am I. 
We're equal. So we're on the same. So how can they claim superiority to me on that basis? Okay. So that's where he begins with this. And that's what he's saying in verse 22. But then he gets to the real point, which is verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so. Now why is he speaking as if insane? Well, that could probably be taken a couple of ways. <laughs> One, it might be say, it be, he, he might be saying, uh, this is insane, I'm having to do this. This is nuts. You ever done something and you told somebody as you was doing it? This is crazy. I say that a lot. <laughs> Older I get, the more I say it, the things I have to do. <laughs> you know, I say, why am I doing this? This is nuts. Well, he could be doing that. Or he could be saying, this is insanity. You all ought to be able to figure out that if they say they are servants, I am more of one than they. Why? Because look at what I've gone through. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? No, it says it makes no sense why I have to say this. To yes, you. right, no. right, right. So he, he finally arrived here in this, and he's now turning back to himself, and he is basically saying he is superior in every way. But now here, you're going to see the beauty of how he works out the balance. Notice what he uses in him bragging on himself. Christ. He uses not his credentials, his speaking ability, his education, the churches he's founded, his travels. He uses his suffering. <laughs> okay, what do you say he's going to do? If I'm going to boast, I'll boast in my what? My suffering. So if they want to see who's equal in service, and that word servant means slave to Christ, he says, let's go ahead and do a comparison here. You know, when you go for a job interview, sometimes you're asked about your credentials. I can remember when I was applying for positions in administration in different places, and I had to type up a, resume or type up a vita is that what they call it now i think about it and, and, and you know you get to that part where you list all of your degrees and then you list all of your uh uh, uh all your accomplishments any uh, awards that you uh, have received and, and and you know you're just basically i always hated that because i felt like i was blowing a horn about myself. But it was the game you had to play because if you went in there and said, well, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. They're going to say, see, you, you won't get the job. You're trying to what? You're going to try to one-up the you're people that are, the, yeah, you're, you're having to say, and the world likes that. That's, the world's controlled by the flesh. But even though I was more fleshly then than I was spiritual, and I am today anyway, <clears throat> I didn't even like it then you know, in, in, in having to do that. And, and you know what always got me was when they asked you the question, well, what would you consider your greatest weakness? You ever notice how most people say, well, my greatest weakness is I work too hard. They are able to turn that question into a, a, a moment of braggadociousness too. Or my, my greatest weakness is I am too focused on the job. And I remember hearing all these because I'd always ask that question. I'm a workaholic. And uh, I, I, I don't think I ever had anybody who said, well, to be honest with you, I'm sometimes lazier than I can. <laughs> <laughs> and I need somebody to kick me in the seat of the pants to get me going. Nobody usually was going to say something like that. And you find that out after you've hired them. <laughs> you know, and then you're sitting there saying, he didn't say that when I asked about his weakness. One of the things the way you look for is, 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 are you a self-starter? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
But it's funny how that bragging comes so easy to the flesh, and we can even take a question like that. But Paul didn't start with his tremendous background. He didn't start with his education. He didn't talk about all his travels or all the churches which he had started. He, he could have said all those kinds of things. He could have spoken of all, all the Christians and miracles he had performed before them, but he didn't do that. Instead of it, he, he starts off by saying, are they slaves of Christ? Are they owned of Christ? He says, uh, even this is bothering him. How could you think that they were? They were showing they were slaves of sin. He says, I speak as if insane to call the false teachers, these false apostles, servants, is reprehensible to him. They are not. He is more so. And the word insane here is not the same that he's used up here earlier when he called himself foolish. When he's talking about this is foolish. This means you're out of your mind. Okay? It, 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 the, the literal, you know what the literal translation is? He's beside himself. So he says, it is insane. I speak as if I'm beside myself. I'm, I'm out of my body. I'm, I'm nuts here. Even suggesting that they might be a, a slave of Christ. As to their birth, we're equal. But to the truth of Jesus, I'm superior because look at what I, will, uh, in, I have endured to see that that truth is taught. So now he starts to boast in his humility. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So let, let, let's look at these credentials. All right, the first one on the list is, he says, I'm more so. And he really just starts off in talking about his suffering. And... Uh, that's really the summative thing, I guess we could say, over the whole list. And when you ask, in what sense is this a credential? How, how can this be a, 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 a point of this makes him a, a true servant of Christ? Okay, you know, well, why are these sufferings even being brought up? What, what does that prove? You know, somebody could twist it and say to themselves, I don't prove anything other than he's stupid. You know, he keeps, keeps getting, getting in trouble. But it actually ties back to what Jesus says, okay, about the apostles. In Matthew chapter 10, and in verses 2 through 4, you find the names of the twelve apostles. And then in verse 5, Jesus starts giving them instructions. Don't go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any city of the Samaritans. But go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, you preach and you say, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Freely you receive. Freely give. And he talks about all of those and then he gets to verse 16 behold I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves so be shrewd as serpents and innocents as doves but beware of men for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you this is a beautiful argument by the way in the synagogues and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. What did he just say was going to be their lot? He sent them out as sheep among what? Wolves. What does wolves do to sheep? So the sufferings should be a big sign. These guys consider themselves slaves? Let's see their list of suffering. See, see what he's done. I mean, this, this is beautiful. How many shipwrecks they had? How many nights in prison have they been? 
How many lashes has been applied to their back? How many times have they gone without food and sleep? Well, they hadn't. I, this, this is just amazing to me. They hadn't. I mean, what are they going to say to this? And they can't say, well, it's because Paul was just unlucky. No, he can tie it back to the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus said this is exactly what was going to happen to those whom he sent, to his apostles. So, who's true? It's happened to me. It ain't happened to them. So by the very criterion that Jesus gave, these guys can't stand up to the test. Wow. That's just the beauty of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the beauty of Paul's life. I mean, the apostles had this prophecy and pledge associated with their message and office. And everywhere Paul went, this is what happened. You remember Acts? Court after court. Remember? Agrippa, Felix, Festus, before the Sanhedrin, before the magistrates, finally to Rome. He was scourged. He was delivered up, handed over for sentencing. And it only, it only happens to him. It happens to all who are God's children. Remember he said, in this world we will have what? Tribulation. Tribulation. But my peace I give unto you, so be of good cheer, for you will overcome the world. So, to be an apostle is to have a life of suffering. And listen, the apostles got a, a, a dose that most Christians don't get. Okay? And it makes sense. They're the leaders of the movement. Who's Satan going to go after the hardest? I remember years ago when I played football, I bought a little book. I, I love middle linebackers, and this was when I was in high school. And uh, Dick Butkus, Dick Butkus. He, he, played, he played for the Chicago Bears, probably one of the hardest hitters that ever played football. I even wanted his jersey. He had 51 on yeah. it. I had a little book on different linebackers. And uh, Ray Nitschke was another one for the Green Bay Packers that was in there. But they was talking about these hard-hitting guys. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting, though, was Butkus, they asked him about it. Why was he so adamant on getting sacks? He wanted to go after the quarterback almost ever played. Most of the time he got more sacks than anybody else because he'd do that middle linebacker blitz. And uh, he told him one time, he said, it's easy, simple. He said, kill the head, the body dies. Ryan Erlinger was another one. Yeah. Kill the head and the body dies. And that's why the apostles got that more than, you know, the run-of-the-mill average Joe Christian. Mm -hmm. All right, these guys have claimed to be apostles. So where are their credentials? Where's your scars? Where's your, where's, Christ promised this to us. So why don't you have them if you're really Christ's apostle? Remember, all of us will suffer persecution in this world. It's just different forms. Uh, but the reason that we do is because we are infiltrating whose kingdom? Satan's. Right? You think he's just going to roll over? Come on in, Sam. I'll give you free reign. No, not if I'm teaching the truth. He would if I teach error. But if I'm teaching the truth, he's going to make it hard. So they get a hostile reaction. Uh, in, in, in Acts 9, uh, I think that we can see that kind of, of, of suffering. Uh, Paul was told by Agabus, if you remember, remember when he took his girdle and said, whoever owns this girdle, that prophet, you know, he said he's going to be taken in bonds and he, he prophesied basically what was going to happen to Paul. And that was up at the at the start, and and it started almost immediately. The Jews wanted him dead, so the first mark of authenticity is suffering. It's just a constant part of Paul's life. Go back to chapter one to point out something. In verse four. Speaking of God, he says, and he, he blessed him in verse 3 with a doxology. Who comforts us all in all our afflictions so that he will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort in abundance through Christ. See, he started this epistle out talking about his sufferings. 
2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Then in verse 6, uh, f but if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort. So now he's talking about it again. Verse 7, and, and he says, we are shares, you are shares of our sufferings. Verse 8, for we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction. I mean, it goes on and on and on. He starts the whole epistle of 2 Corinthians out talking about his, his suffering that he has experienced on and for the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And so basically what he's, what he's saying here is that I have uh, suffered all of these things for the ministry's sake. So that's basically the sufferings. Now let's look at it specifically in verse 23. Are they slaves of Christ? I speak of his saying, I more so in far more labors. All right, that's the next thing he mentions. So you got sufferings in general. Here's copus. Copus is a Greek word which means hard work under difficult situations. The Greek word for labor is hard work under difficult situations. Painful work. What do we call a woman giving birth? What's she in? Painful. She is in labor, right? You know, it's agony. Uh, it was also used a lot of times in the Greeks when they talked about working to the point of sweat and exhaustion and almost collapse. So Paul says, not only did I suffer, let me get it more specific, I suffered in labors. I, I, I suffered to the point of exhaustion. Hard, painful work. What about you guys? You didn't even start Corinth. You all just rolled in here with a letter saying that you were good and said, can we preach? And you stupid Corinthians, you let them. No evidence, no credentials. Well, how, you know, you didn't start to... The, remember when he talked over there earlier about building on another man's work? Well, I was thinking if they're real, they shouldn't be coming here. They should be going where? Where there was no church and getting it started. Oh, that's too hard. That's too hard. I'd rather go somewhere where they're already there and already in, in place and doing everything that they could. I can remember when I was a young preacher... That was what I thought I really wanted, was I wanted to go somewhere where there was this big, nice congregation. And all I had to do was just get my lessons up and preach and stand in the pulpit on Sunday and Sunday night and teach a little bit on Wednesday night. And the church would be all doing what they're supposed to do and everybody, and I thought, oh, if I could only find a place like that. And I never did. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but but you know that's the that's the folly of youth, I guess. I suppose you know. Yeah, yeah, right. And even now, they tell me to go find a real church, and what the, that's what they mean when they say that to me. Right. You know, go find you a real church, one that can pay you a good salary and give you that house next door, and and, and you can tickle their little ears on Sunday morning, and and, and bring them in like 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 bees to. To sugar, you know, bring them in, fill the building. Let's have a lot of people, and, and they'll praise you and shake your hand, and tell you how wonderful your message was, and hug your neck, and and do all that kind of stuff. And sounds all good to one part of me, but that's unfortunately the bad part of me. That's my flesh. Uh, it's never gone that way. You just stuck with a little Duke Street. I got Duke Street. Actually, this is a blessing. <laughs> it would be a really hard way if I didn't have this little place to roll back into. <laughs> uh, but that's what he mentions. He says, uh, then he mentions, in far more imprisonments. Oh, well, turn over to Acts 16. Let's look at some examples. Aren't you glad that the Lord took us through Acts before we got over here into some of these things? <laughs> But over in uh, Acts chapter 16, Paul has the Macedonian vision. 
I, you know, I love this because we're reading so much of the stuff that in his letters. Remember how he's talked about how the churches of Macedonia helped him when he had no money? Uh, verse 14 is where that happened at. First convert on European soil was a lady by the name of Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics. A worshiper of God was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. I had a meeting canceled because I read that verse to you all. We're scared of Sam. He said the Lord opened the heart. I don't think Sam said that. I think Luke wrote it. <laughs> what do you all think? <laughs> oh, me. Me, 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 me. You see what I'm saying? But anyway, uh, but while he was there, uh, they have a problem because there was this lady who followed Paul everywhere they went verse 16 they were going to a place of prayer and the slave girl having spirit of divination met us who was bringing her master as much profit by fortune telling that is she was a inhabited by an evil spirit and she's following Paul and kept crying out these men are bond servants of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation now you may wonder, why would Paul want to stop that? Well, first of all, Jesus don't need advertisements from Satan. Nor does his messengers. Most people knew she had an, a, a spirit in her. So they would then equate Paul and them equal to her. And not see that they weren't, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? This, so as she continued doing this for many days, and Paul was greatly annoyed. She's a sewer fly. You know how a fly buzzes around your head and you just can't get rid of them? And so Paul decides to swat at her. So he turns and he says to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ come out of her, and it came out that very moment. Well, that cost the masters, the people who own this slave girl, their money. They were making money on her fortune-telling. So they bring Paul to the authorities. You may wonder, well, on what basis? Well, he's teaching a religion they had not yet had approved in Greece. And so the crowd rose up eventually. Um, and uh, the chief magistrates tore the robes and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanded the jailer to guard them securely. There's his first, uh, the first imprisonment recorded for us. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Now remember that when we studied that, that means they put their legs in these things. They have them shackled to the wall. They set them down. They put your legs in these uh, pieces of wood that uh, have a crank, and they start cranking your legs apart until they are always almost to the point of dislocating from the hips. And then they, then they leave you there for the night or for however long they want to keep you. And uh, so... That's where it was. But then he went to prison in Jerusalem. Remember when they arrested him after he tried to take those, uh, he was taking some men into the temple to be purified. And the people from Ephesus that didn't like him saw him and said, he's taking Gentiles into the temple. Well, he was not. They had seen him earlier in the week with a Gentile convert. But... They all ran, and there was that big riot. And remember, the soldiers come out and didn't know what was going on and rescued him. They didn't rescue him because they liked him. They just didn't want somebody killed on their watch. Took him up on the stairs, and he asked that soldier, he said, can I speak to these people? And that soldier said, you want to talk to them? <laughs> and so Paul raised his hand, and they all got quiet. And then when they got quiet, yeah, he gave them a little sermon, then they went crazy again. They had to jerk him inside. So that started his two or three years of prison before he went to Rome the first time, you know. And uh, he'd always wanted to go to Rome. And he got there. So there he was, back to Second Corinthians 11. So 
Yes, he had numerous imprisonments, and that's just the ones that are recorded for us. I'm sure there were others. Then he was beaten. He says, beaten times without number. Paul said, I, ain't, I, I, I can't even give you a number on that one. And uh, there, well, we just saw it in Acts 12, 16. They beat him with rods. You know what that means, don't you? Okay, that's different than beating you with a scourge or a whip. What they would do, they took and they would take these kind of like bamboo-looking rods and they would tie them together in bundles. So you had a little bundle of them. And, you know, their strength, two-fold uh, two cords not easily broken. So they have it like that. Then they line you up, strip you back, and chain you up like that. Then they just start hitting you. It didn't do as much cutting as it did bruising. Bruising and Okay, yeah. But it, it was a bruiser. You know how a whip will cut the skin. This, this, this bruised. That was its purpose. And so you'd leave with your back literally black and blue. Not so much with the skin opened. And he said, I had that done to me. I don't know how many times. I can't even tell you. And um, he mentions danger of death. Uh, that means that there were some, you know, Paul, his entire life from his conversion until he died, he went to bed every night not knowing whether or not he would get killed. Every time he woke up in the morning and stepped out of wherever he stayed, the threat of death, every day. Death. The threat of death was constantly on his head because he had everybody gunning for him. Everybody. Everywhere. Okay, Mr. False Teacher. How we doing? Where's your credentials? How many times you been in prison? See, he didn't come at him from, I'm really smart. I studied at the foot of Gamaliel. Who'd you all study under? <laughs> you know, he didn't do that. His comment is, okay, I got arrested a bunch of times. How many times did you get arrested? None? None? How many times have you been beaten? You want to take your shirts off and let's look at our backs? How many times have you been beaten? How many times have you worked to the point of exhaustion? You Corinthians, have you seen them do that here like I did? Because remember, at one point, Paul was without food at Corinth because the Macedonian churches brought it to him. And he says, when I was in need of food, which meant I had no food. What about you guys? You guys look like fat cats to me. You know. So, they, uh, the false teachers could not. They compromised. They wanted to have prosperity. They wanted to be popular. They wanted acceptance. Paul goes on. He says, on five occasions, I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Now, you know, in the, th this comes from the Old Testament. In fact, let's just look at it. I always like to do that. We've got enough time. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. And let's see. Well, sorry, that little minions come in here <laughs> again. Deuteronomy 25. And hid my books of the Bible. In Deuteronomy 25, he says, If there is a dispute beginning in verse 1 between men, and they go to court, and the judges decide their case, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall then make him lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of stripes according to his guilt. He may beat him forty times, but no more so that he does not beat him with many more stripes and these and your, brothers is, and your brother is not disgraced in your eyes. There's where that comes from. Forty, forty licks. Now, they're beating. I mean, let me tell you what. Back in those days, that, you, you notice in ancient Israel, there were no prisons. They didn't have jails. Now, by the time you get to Jesus' day, there's prisons because they're Roman. But under, when they were wandering in the wilderness, when they first went into the Holy Land, here's, here's what happened. You either got beaten or you got killed when you broke a crime, when you committed a crime, depending on what you did. 
or you know lesser ones fined or whatever but you know punishment was quick it was done it's over if it was murder adultery any of those kinds of things they killed you they stoned you you just taken out of circulation they didn't do that to correct you. They did that to protect the integrity of that. See, somewhere along the line, crime and punishments got messed up. We look at a penal system as being a ref reformation to reform the convict. Listen, there is only one person who can change the heart of a man or woman, and that's God. The purpose of the penal system is to remove from society those who are a danger to the safety and prosperity of others. So therefore, the punishment is not for that person, it's for the protection of us who have committed no crime. You got a guy who keeps stealing stuff, you don't want your stuff stolen, do you? Well, get him off the streets. Get him out of society. But see, People in a worldly sense, with the worldly mindset, say, oh, we can change him. You know, that's just like watching those shows on TV where people take in uh, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my, and try to make them domesticated pets. And then everybody is shocked when, well, I had that bear for three years and it ate my son. <laughs> you know, well, what do you think bears are going to do? You know, I, I can remember back home, and you've, we, I've heard of the stories down here too. Well, I was probably no people's happened. I knew an old man back home who had a bull. He had raised from a bottle. Mm -hmm. And he went out and would, uh, uh, he, he would take his bull, take his bull, he would follow him like a dog out in the pasture and come up and rub its head on him and everything. One morning he goes to the barn, kills him in the lot. They had to put the bull down to get the body. They did, Mr. Pennycuff said, my neighbor up the road it kept, went after his son and killed his son. Yeah. Took a horn and drove it through his son's body. And they did, they like never got him. But you know a bull's a bull. When well, they come out and there was a female bull and I guess they yeah. were, that time was Well, it was just like, I, I, I rode horses and trained horses and I never let my guard down around a stallion. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, once you gelded one, it was a different matter. You could do that. They were pretty good. But even then, you have to have healthy respect for them. They're, you know, you don't... Uh, you know, I, I've seen men go up and stand behind and say, that's my horse, it'll never kick me, <laughs> you know, about that time it dies. Well, you don't know. That's always but, what I used to worry me. Somebody walk behind one and smack him on the rear. Yeah. That's always coming and said, you're going to get kicked one of these. Yeah, you but, 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 you know, a stallion is is not not trustworthy all the time. You know, but, I mean, they, 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 they have that gene in them, and they're, they're, even though domesticated, they're not domesticated like a dog, you know. But, but nonetheless, uh, they just punished you. Uh, and that punishment would be death or they would give you a, a whipping. And when they whipped you, they would lay you down and they would take a leather strap and they would hit you. And then they would turn you over and hit you on the front side. So you guys, so I assume probably 20 on the back side, 20 on the front. That led red, red whelps and depending on whoever it was. Now, by the time you go through and they get back from Babylonian captivity, it was the leader of the synagogue that gave the whipping. And he was obligated to use all of his strength in delivering the lashes. You know, he couldn't just cut you a break. But God limited it to only 40. That seems like a lot to me, but 40. You didn't, you, you didn't have to... Do 40, but if the judge said, you know, maximum, you could do. But the Jews knew that you could lose count. So you know what they always did? You know how the Pharisees had rules for everything? They'd give 39. Just in case, maybe they threw in a 40th one by accident. So that was why he says the Jews uh, uh, gave him 39 lashes. And that was on five occasions. So do you realize now what Paul meant when he said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beaten with those rods, lashed like this. You know, he, he, he carried around the scars of his suffering for Jesus. Three times he was beaten with rods and uh, once I was stoned. We know about that one. 
That's over in the book of Acts. You remember that? That's at Lystra. Yeah, they let everybody think, and the disciples all come around and stand around him and mourn. And he comes back and he goes back into town. And is preaching. And he says, I was shipwrecked. We know about that one. But there's two other times he was also shipwrecked. But you remember the hurricane he got caught in? How was it? What was it pronounced? Or Usadon or whatever it was. But they were, remember when he told them when they got ready to leave, he said, I don't think we need to go. Remember that? And they all said, because they had passed, they were into the time of the storms. And, but they had a pretty day and they all took off. He was headed to Rome. And then when the storm struck and they got caught in a hurricane and ended up on, what was it, Malta? Malta, that Yeah, island. the Isle of Malta, a little speck. All driven by God. So Nobody said, was lost. Yeah, that's, that's right. He says, I was in the deep a day and a night. And I, I have spent in the deep. So, this is Paul's life. We'll pick up with some of the others next time. Uh, but I wanted to get through verse 25. So, but, but the argument here is, as you can see, these guys call themselves servants of Jesus Christ you gotta be crazy I speak as if insane they're not slaves they've had none of this happen to them and Jesus said this would happen to his apostles so you all should be able to discern now by just looking at our lives my life versus theirs and see that we're not of the same cloth. And mine is in line with what Jesus said would happen. Jesus didn't promise us, well, who had Tammy Wynette, Rose Garden? No, never promised us a Rose Garden. Yeah, right, you know, didn't promise, so promise, promise you a Rose Anderson. Garden. Uh, Anderson, yeah, I can't remember, Rose I get them all mixed up. Tammy Wynette, she sang it. Bill Anderson wrote it. But anyway, uh, but that's the thing that, uh, It was Lynn Anderson instead of Wynand, I believe. You're right. Uh, but but that, that's where he's going with this. So as he boasts, his boasting is in his suffering. So you know where that takes you back to? <clears throat> you look at that list and you say, well, how did he get through all this? Why is he still alive? This would have killed most people. How is he still able to go? power of God. God is sustaining him. God's not through with him. And he's brought him through all of it. Brought him through it all. So there's his proof. And there's my badge. It's what God has done for me. What God has done through me. Not a thing I've done on my own. Wonderful, wonderful study. Let's ask the Lord to bless us. Father, thank you so much for the story that we have had before us today for this epistle. Thank you for allowing us to sit at the feet of your great apostle Paul. For we know that these are his words. This was his life. And how you sustained him and took care of him and the great work that he has done. Bless us in like manner, Father, as we serve you as well. We ask now that you would guide us and keep us through this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.